Good afternoon, everybody. And I would like to welcome you to the first plenary uh, lecture today. And it's going to be uh, given by Professor Han Brunner. It is a great honor and a pleasure for me to invite Professor Brunner and to speak a little bit about him before his lecture. Professor Brunner is one of the most eminent medical scientists in the field of medical genetics. He is currently the full professor and the head of the Institute of Human Genetics at the Radbourne University Medical Center in Nijmegen. And he also is the chairman and the, of the Institute of Human Genetics at Maastricht in the Netherlands. He graduated in medicine in, from Groningen and subsequently went on to complete his clinical training in medical genetics. And he trained under two eminent medical geneticists at Radboud. He also completed a PhD and his topic was on myotonic dystrophy. And his research led to a seminal publication in the New England Journal of Medicine on the observations that his team were able to make of the myotonic dystrophy expansion, which is a trinucleotide expansion reversing in certain situations. He, like many other geneticists, has used his clinical knowledge and very careful observation of clinical problems to try to be the basis for his research in genetics. And his, he and colleagues have added significantly to our knowledge on very many different fields in genetics, including congenital malformations, brain developmental disorders, skeletal dysplasias and other malformations, as well as significant inputs that they have made into the understanding of the genetic basis of intellectual disability. In terms of assessment of somebody's scientific output, you can measure it in many ways. And you can measure it, of course, in the numbers of publications that someone has made. And Han Brunner has more than 400 publications, many of these being in top scientific journals, including Nature, Cell, um, Science, the New England Journal, Nature Genetics, American Journal of Human Genetics, and the Journal of Clinical Investigations. He has over 300,000 uh, citations and an H index of 103. He has been the president of the European Society of Human Genetics and holds multiple advisory memberships in committees, both in Holland and elsewhere. He has been a member of multiple journal editorial committees and is currently an editor of the Journal of Medical Genetics, Clinical Genetics and Molecular Syndromology. He was elected to the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Sciences and he's a member of the Academia Europea. He was inducted as a knight in the Order of the Netherlands Lion. He has received multiple local and international awards, including the King Faisal International Prize in Medicine, the Stanley Davidson Memorial Lecture at the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh, the Carter Medal of the Clinical Genetic Society of Great Britain, and has been awarded the biannual Gardia Director at the Dutch Society of Human Genetics. He's an outstanding researcher with multiple young PhD students under him, and he's already had 30 PhDs completed under him, and many of his students are already established and contributing significantly in the field of genetics. But although we can measure those metrics, the other quality that I see in Han and I respect enormously is his great clinical judgment and acumen. And that's much harder to identify. But at least in terms of the widely held respect that he has among the world of clinical geneticists and the fact that many people ask and respect his opinion, I think indicates how much he contributes as a clinician as well. So without any further ado, I'd like to invite Professor Han Brunner to deliver today's lecture. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Han Brunner. And I'm a clinical and human geneticist from the Netherlands. 
And today I shall be speaking about the question of whether genetics is going to be the basis of modern medicine. But first, let me congratulate you on your 30th anniversary celebration of your Faculty of Medicine at the University of Kalania. Congratulations, Suva Betum. I'm going to speak, be speaking a lot about DNA technology and the application of it in medicine. And some of my enthusiasm derives from the fact that we do a lot of genetic testing and a small portion of that we do for a fee. So we actually make some money that we use to fund our research in this way. The whole story of the genome in practical terms started in 2000 with this announcement, then by Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, who uh, announced the completion of the draft human genome sequence. And Clinton at that time said, without a doubt, this is the most important, most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. And there's a bit of hyperbole there, but this was a major moment 20 years ago. And the fascination with this development has not uh, um, become less. Uh, it's still there, uh, and this is a, a current exhibit at the Smithsonian Institute in Washington called Genome Unlocking Lives Code. A number of things became very clear, for instance, that we just have 20,000 genes as human beings, and there is not more genes in humans than in other species. It also showed that we're quite similar to some of the great apes like chimpanzees and to a lesser extent gorillas. And it also showed that our genes were quite similar to things like chicken, uh, with uh, about two thirds of our genes being almost identical to those of chicken. And that, of course, explains a few things. It explains why we're much more likely to pick up diseases from chicken than we are likely to pick up tobacco mosaic virus, because that's a plant virus and a plant genome is so different to ours that it's very unlikely that a plant pathogen will uh, work its way into us. Now, Clinton said something else. He did not just say it was the most wondrous map ever produced by humankind. He also said it will re revolutionize the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of most, if not all, human diseases. So that's more hyperbole. And you can see Francis Cl uh, Collins to the right of him there, uh, smiling, because he wrote some of this text. And he became the director of the NIH in America. So he's quite an influential figure. How much of this has turned out to be true? Was it prophetic? Well, it needed another um, development. And this was whole genome sequencing. This is the, uh, the technology to actually read the genome at scale. And this happened around 2006. And from that point on, it became feasible to sequence entire human sequences, uh, genome sequences. And the first people to be sequenced were one of the inventors of the technology, Craig Venter, uh, but also Jim Watson of Watson and Crick and the double helix. And then other geneticists started sequencing themselves as examples. Uh, and then uh, people started sequencing celebrities, including a former hard rock star by the name of Ozzy Osbourne. And then of course, it had been established that this technology worked. What took over, however, was not genome sequencing, but exome sequencing. Exome sequencing basically means sequencing only the genes. Only 1% of our genome is genes, and you can fish out this, the, the bits that are genes, uh, and then uh, sequence those. And it's much less work and much less expensive. It's still 35 million DNA uh, bases, uh, and it, it comes in about 20,000 genes. And when you do that, you see that we're all different. Uh, there's about 100 variants between every two persons that are sequenced. But at least it's a manageable number, and we can now investigate these differences uh, by comparing individual exomes. 
And we rapidly took this to the clinic and started using these as clinical exomes in, 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 in an effort to try and diagnose disease. And our fo focus obviously was on rare diseases. Now, rare disease diseases affect uh, very few individuals in the population. It's, by definition, their occurrence is in less than one in 2,000 individuals. So that would be less than, a, 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 let's say, a 100 a new diagnoses per year in your country. But there are so many of these rare diseases. There are at least 8,000 and possibly there are 10,000 rare diseases. And that means that if you add them all up, uh, they're not that rare. There's quite a, a number of them. And the other thing is that rare diseases are mostly of genetic origin. So rare diseases are not rare if you add them all up. And uh, the current number that people quote is that one in 17 individuals will at some point in their lifetime have a rare disease. And that's 6%, that's about a million uh, people in your country and in my country, because we have roughly the same number of citizens. Rare diseases are often genetic. They're often not diagnosed because they're too rare to be uh, common, commonly seen in clinics. And they're often misdiagnosed for the same reason. But they're really important. They, they account for 25% of admissions in pediatrics uh, in some series and 10% in others, but quite a, a ser serious number. And they account for quite a large fraction of all deaths in pediatrics, certainly in, in, in neonates. One example of a rare disease that we've studied extensively is intellectual disability. So here's the problem. Uh, a few percent of patients with intellectual disability have Down syndrome, which you can detect by carrier type, which is also recognizable. A very small fraction is due, due to the environment. And uh, another very small fraction are syndromes that we are easily recognizable other than Down syndrome. And, and there's a very small fraction that are due to inherited errors of metabolism that you can screen for using biochemistry. So the large majority of all intellectual disability is of unknown reason or was until uh, genome sequencing and exome sequencing came about. Here's an example. This is a patient I saw many years ago. This is Sibe. And Siba uh, has moderate to severe intellectual disability, has autism, and he has a number of, of uh, minor um, uh, problems. Uh, well, actually one major problem called malrotation of the bowel, of which I will tell you in a minute. He had cryptorchidism and he had vesicourethric reflux. And he had quite a striking face. So I told the parents, I, told, I said, you know, I think Siba might have a syndrome. And I said, oh, that's good. Uh, what syndrome does he have? And I said, I have no idea. He just looks different. He's got these, this very thin, thin upper lip and downturned corners of the mouth and a short nose and high arched, arched eyebrows and these down slanting um, palpable fissures and these low set ears. I think he's, he looks quite distinctive. And they said, yeah, we can see that too. Um, do you think he's the only one in the world? I, said, I don't know, I'll try and find out. So I started with their permission to show this picture to other clinical geneticists. And after a few years, I met someone from Belgium who said, I think I've seen this. And he had this other boy from another country who has the short, uh, sorry, the thin upper lip, the downturned corners of the mouth, the short nose, the arched eyebrows, the down slanting uh, eyelids, and the low, low set ears. He said, they look very similar, don't they? And I agreed, and the families agreed. They thought they had the same thing. So then when exome sequencing came, we could study the genes of Siba and this other boy and found they had a single new mutation. A new mutation means that there's something different in the child compared to both parents. That in itself is not rare. Actually, almost every child has a new mutation. But most new mutations 
either are not uh, in an important gene or they don't have make a big change to the gene. So they will not have limited impact. But the mutation, interestingly, in SIBA and this other boy were identical. They were not just in the same gene, but they affected the same identical DNA nucleotide. And that, of course, with 20,000 genes is no coincidence. This was a new syndrome. And we published this as a new syndrome in 2012. And immediately, this had impact. It really is important to see his parents, because you see, it finally tells them what's going on. It finally explains why their child is so different. It gives them clarity. That's important. It also tells them that they haven't done anything wrong. A lot of parents, especially mothers, think that they've done something wrong during pregnancy, and they feel guilty about it. And we could tell Siba's parents this was a new mutation. It's a spontaneous event. It's nothing they did and nothing they could have prevented. It also tells them that the risk of this happening again is quite low. It's only about 1%. Now that was confusing because you see, we only found, had the technology to find this answer after about 10 years. And by this time, the parents had decided to not have any more children. So when the news came that there was no actual risk, it was too late and they couldn't change their, their lives again. But it still gave hope that, you know, with this increased understanding, that might be of benefit to SIBE. Now, strangely, that happened because, you see, SIBE had this complication of malrotation, had volvulus, which meant that a part of his bowel died and it had to be resected. All this happened when he was quite little and he ended up with short bowel. Now, at 10 years of age, he was not growing very well. And his pediatric gastroenterologist got in touch with me and said, do you think this is because of his syndrome? Or do you think it's because he has short bowel and he doesn't uh, digest his food very well? So I could tell him, I could tell this other doctor, I said, well, I know of one other patient in the world who has this. And he didn't have the bowel problem and he has normal growth. So I think the probable explanation for why it doesn't grow is the short bowel, and I think you should investigate. So it actually had management implications. Then there were more patients, uh, and they were found either because of our publications and other clinicians started uh, doing exome sequencing, and they found other patients with this same identical mutation. But interestingly, most of the matches, matches happened through mothers who found each other by, via Facebook. So one of the mothers started a Facebook on the Pax1 gene. Other mothers found this Facebook page. They got in touch and they were much, much more efficient than all the doctors in the world in finding each other. So this ended three years ago. Uh, uh, this, this resulted in a family uh, meeting uh, in... Um, Nijmegen, my city, uh, and this is Siebe uh, highlighted and all these other kids who have the same thing. And it was a wonderful meeting because there was so much they could recognize and there's so much they could talk about. We didn't cure the problem, but at least these families were no longer alone with their problem. And this impact of diagnosis is universal. This is Farah. And Farah was another one that we saw early in 2011. We found a grin 2 a spontaneous mutation in her. She has very severe epilepsy, very severe retardation. And the uh, grin 2 a finding changed her treatment a little bit, but it did tr change her treatment massively still. The mother wrote to me, she said, uh, just last year, she said, really, the day you informed us of the diagnosis was the best day of my life. You see, it gives so much more clarity. It is really helpful to just have a diagnosis. Okay, now 60% of intellectual disability is by these new mutations. And we can now diagnose these. 
So what causes new mutations? Well, I said they were spontaneous, but there is actually one known risk factor. And this one known risk factor is age. But it's not the age of the mother. You see, it's mainly the age of the father. We all know that the risk of karyotype abnormalities increases with the age of the mother. But the risk of gene mutations increases with the age of the father. And this is to do with aging sperm. You see, because men keep producing sperm all their lives, they have to make new sperm every day. And with every time there is a cell division during spermatogenesis, there's a very small risk that there will be another mutation introduced. And this is from a a paper 10 years ago from Iceland that showed this relationship between paternal age and the risk of new mutations. And it's quite linear. Our experience with clinical exposomes has been really very good. And it's been so good that we are now tempted to say doctors are great. And I'm a medical doctor, so I can say this, but exomes we think are better in terms of diagnosis of rare disease. And we proved this. And this is from a work we did uh, published four years ago, working with our colleagues from pediatric neurology. This is about 150 consecutive patients that were referred to pediatric neurology over a five year period. They had either intellectual disability or movement disorder or neuromuscular problems or epilepsy or various combinations of these. There were males and females, they were different ages. And we basically compared two paths towards diagnosis. The first path we call the standard pathway. This is what the pediatric neurologist does when reviewing and investigating a child with these problems. They do MRI scans, they do various biopsies, they do CSF analysis, they do EMG, you know, whatever it takes and whatever they can think of. And they also do genetic analysis of genes and perhaps karyotypes and so on. The other path was through exome sequencing, which is called WES for whole exome sequencing. And the first thing you'd notice is that these paths did not really differ in cost. They were both expensive. All the workup by the pediatric neurologist was expensive, and the exome sequencing was also expensive. So that was not really the difference. What was different was the number of diagnoses that were made. So the pediatric neurologist through their, all their expertise, and we have wonderful pediatric neurologists, managed to diagnose in 12 out of 150 patients, or about 8%. Exome sequencing managed to diagnose in about 40 patients, or almost 30%, so a much higher rate of diagnosis. So this changes the way we do diagnosis in this difficult category. We go from clinical diagnosis first to molecular diagnosis first. And that is partly because it's just too hard. There are just too many of these syndromes there, and they're not always very recognizable uh, and, they, um, and they tend to resemble each other as well. So, the paradigm we're all brought up in, in medical school, is this. Here's a medical doctor. Here is a patient. The doctor looks at the patient and thinks, ah, I know. You have Shrek syndrome. And if that happens, the doctor can do a very precise test. However, what happens most of the time is, here's the doctor. 
Here is another patient. The doctor carefully investigates the patient and thinks, I have no idea. And because there are 8,000 different rare diseases, what do you do? The only logical way forward is a broad screening test and exome sequencing provides that test. So I've told you about our, our uh, experience with intellectual disability, which is indeed a, a large fraction of what we diagnose in our clinics. However, exome sequencing and rare disease are applicable to a broad range of diseases, and in fact, to all rare diseases, and they are uh, across all, all different uh, organs and specialities. So there's a lot of neurological diseases that are rare and genetic, deafness, blindness, kidney disease, immune disorders, and so on. And you find positive diagnoses in all of these categories. This is uh, from a few years, years ago, and the hit rate, the diagnostic rate for all these different organ systems goes from 20% to about 60%. It's very high for things like deafness and blindness. So this is what Clinton said, it will revolutionize the diagnosis, prevention and treatment of most, if not all human diseases. So is it doing that? Well, I think it is. Uh, it is certainly, as I showed you, changing things for suspected genetic disease, but it also changes it in very good ways. For instance, for muscular dystrophy, it used to be that you, you had to do a muscular biopsy to be sure what the diagnosis was. Um, and that is now different. That's now different because for muscular dystrophy, it's been shown that if you do uh, exome sequencing or a panel of DNA uh, uh, for, of genes by sequencing, you actually, again, diagnose more and for less money. So it's quite, it has good utility to change your practice from doing a biopsy as your standard procedure to doing exome sequencing as your standard procedure. For renal disease, um, renal biopsies can be partly replaced by exome sequencing. For non-genetic diseases, some of the microbiology testing can be replaced by uh, DNA sequencing because bacteria and viruses of course have DNA or RNA. But also tumor cancer genetics, cancer diagnostics is becoming partly by sequencing. For instance, all patients with ovarian cancer in the Netherlands are now tested for BRCA. And all patients with breast cancer are now tested for BRCA because it, it even influences their treatment. It even influences their surgical uh, procedures. It also opens the door for treatment with this new class of drugs called PARP inhibitors that were invented because people understood what the BRCA gene meant in biology. So it's all already um, affecting how we treat our patients, even for things that are not necessarily genetic. So we're moving from this clinical diagnosis first to a molecular diagnosis first paradigm. Is this affordable? Well, a few years ago, this looked really optimistic. You see, because sequencing costs had fallen dramatically over 10 years time. This new technology of whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing is relatively expensive, but it's also relatively efficient and it can be automated. So sequencing costs had really uh, dropped dramatically. But then, over the last five years, they stopped falling, which is strange because technology keeps improving. So why would sequencing costs no longer fall? Unfortunately, the probable reason for that is that there is a monopoly by this one company that makes all the 
sequencing machines that almost every lab in the world uses. And they have a patent and they are clever, so they protect it with very, very expensive and very good lawyers. And over time, the shares of the Illumina company have uh, gone up more than 20 fold, whereas average shares have gone up two fold. So what does that mean? Well, it means that as long as this patent is there and it prevents other companies from entering the market, these sequencing costs are not going to drop very much. So all we can do is hope that that situation will change, either by a new technology, which I think will happen in the long run, or by um, the end of the patent, which I don't know if it will happen because that's a legal question, or by some other factor. Okay, so far I've been talking about new mutations. These are, are genetic events that are not inherited from either parent. But of course, some conditions are inherited and they're actually inherited from both parents. And we call this autosomal recessive, as you all know. And with all the sequencing data we have, we can now uh, examine and see what the situation is. What are the Dutch carry carriers for? So we did this and we compared Dutch exomes and exomes from Estonia, another country in Northern Europe, which to us is quite far away. And we found that the results are quite similar. We found that for Dutch and Estonians, about two, two, every person carries about two genetic variants for any recessive disorders or about 1.3 variants for a severe disease. If you compare the Dutch and the Estonians, the genes that are common are quite similar. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you see CFTR, which is called cystic fibrosis, which is common both in the Dutch and the Estonians. As you see in the uh, uh, upper right-hand corner, you see in the yellow circle, you see PAH, which is phenylketonuria, which again is common in both populations. And generally there's quite a good correlation between the, uh, the genes and the populations. But there's very little correlation if you look at the variants. So the pattern is the same, but the actual genetic variants are quite distinct between Estonians and Dutch. What that means, we think, is first of all, of course, they're 2000 kilometers apart and people just didn't tend to travel very much between Estonia and the Netherlands uh, until very recently. So there's not been much gene flow. Also what we think this means is that these alleles, they originate locally. They're not incredibly old. Some of them are, but most are relatively recent. So they arose separately in Estonia and the Netherlands by spontaneous mutation. And then there was selection. And the selection is based on the phenotype. And you all know about selection and how this works because that explains why in Sri Lanka you have a lot of thalassemia. And that's because there used to be malaria. And we in the Netherlands and Estonia, we have a lot of cystic fibrosis because of other evolutionary pressures. So if you think about this simplistically, you can get a very similar landscape and some differences by the environment. So what I think means I think for Sri Lanka, and I'm not sure about this, is I, I suspect that most of your genetic landscape is going to be very similar to ours. And some of it is going to be different because of these different evolutionary factors like infections. What we found that one in a hundred couples is at 25% risk because both are carriers of a severe recessive disease. We also found that if you ha have a consanguineous couple for first cousins, for instance, that risk is about 15 to 20 times higher. So that's quite a significant increase. And you can see this, of course, in your clinics. Now we have to pause for a moment here and think, it, am I just talking about rare disease? And mostly I am. But you see, rare disease can hide in, in uh, unsuspected places. 
For instance, rare variants causing rare disease can be hidden among a multitude of people who have ostensibly the same disease. Take diabetes. There is this condition called maturity onset diabetes of the young, or the other MODI, which is a monogenic form of diabetes that starts uh, relatively early with type 2 diabetes. We've talked about BRCA1 occurring in breast cancer. Now, most patients with breast cancer have non-genetic disease, but a small proportion, a few percent, have monogenic breast cancer. And I'm just going to show you one example uh, that we found last year that pertains to COVID-19. So we got interested last year in the question of whether people with unusually severe COVID-19 might have an underlying genetic defect. And, for, uh, and this work um, was successful and we did find something, uh, especially about young men with severe COVID-19. Of course, these men stand out. And they stood out for two reasons. One was they were relatively young and they ended up in intensive care. So the first family, one man uh, ended up in intensive care at age 31 and his brother died in intensive care at age 29. The other thing, of course, that was striking was that these were brothers uh, and their parents who also had a COVID, at least some of them, uh, didn't have, had actually mild disease. So it was not to do with the virus itself. It was something with these men that caused them to have much more severe disease. So what was it? What we found studying all 20,000 genes was that they, these two families and the men in the families, they had the same uh, gene that was defective. It was on the X chromosome, which of course explains why it was men. Uh, and it was in a gene called TLR7. Now TLRs or toll-like receptors are important in immunity. And when a virus infection happens, for instance, with a SARS type virus, uh, there will be uh, various immune responses mediated by uh, white blood cells, such as uh, uh, dendritic cells. And what happens is, first of all, there is, there is tissue damage and there are oxidative uh, phospholipids, and these can be detected by toll-like receptor 4, and that will generate an immune response uh, via cytokines. And that's very nonspecific. Similarly, after uptake by these white blood cells, the viral, viral RNA is detected in endosomes. And it's again by viral, uh, sorry, by toll-like receptors, specifically toll-like receptor 3 and toll-like receptor 4. And this leads to the production of interferon, especially type 1 interferon, which is sort of the the first line immune defense we have against these types of viruses. So it's very quick, it's very effective. And if this system work, works, that's part of how you combat the virus. However, if you do not have toll like receptor 7, then there's a problem. And this is cells of these patients and their parents tested for a response into interferon gamma production. And as you can see, the white blood cells are not capable of producing any interferon gamma. And that's worrying. And that explains why they have this defective uh, response to the virus and why they get much, much more sick and sometimes die. This work has been since uh, replicated by a few groups. Uh, and we now know that a few percent of those men with unusually severe COVID have this very, very specific immune defect. They're entirely healthy otherwise, unless they're confronted with one of these SARS type viruses like COVID. And then um, they, they have to really be uh, um, taken care of very carefully, otherwise they may well die. Okay, this is what I've been telling you. Rare diseases, by definition, 
are individually rare. They occur in one in less than one in 2,000 individuals. But the, because there are so many rare diseases, there must be at least 8,000, possibly 10,000. Together, they can affect as much as 6% of the population or 1 million people in Sri Lanka. So it is a major healthcare burden. New mutations explain most severe intellectual handicaps, uh, but also about 1% of the population of couples and about 15 to 20% of first cousin couples are 25% risk of recessive disease in their offspring. And this can be blindness or deafness or kidney disease or muscle disease or many other diseases. Some of them very severe and some of them lethal. I think it's quite possible that over time we will end up having a carrier testing before marriage, preconceptual carrier testing. And this is tricky because not everybody agrees that this is that this should be done. And it's ethically sensitive. But I think there is a, an ongoing discussion to try this. And there's also already a pilot project in Australia to try this uh, on 10,000 couples. I've also told you that rare genetic variants can lead to what looks like common disease, and it can even influence infectious disease. And this again is detectable by exome sequencing. So that leaves the last question. What about this promise of genetic therapy? And it was promised, you see. In the same speech, in the same announcement in the White House in the year 2000, Bill Clinton said, it will revolutionize the diagnosis, prevention and treatment of most, if not all human diseases. So how much of that is happening? Is there a treatment revolution? Well, there isn't. There's not a treatment revolution, but there is treatment evolution. Some of it is happening. And of course, treatment is much, much slower than diagnosis. And treatment often takes 15 to 20 years for all the steps to be taken to make it possible. But it has happened in a few instances. For instance, in this condition, very severe condition called spinal muscular atrophy, which occurs everywhere. And I've noticed it also occurs in Sri Lanka. It's a very rare disease. It's because of a, a, a defect in a gene called SMN1, and it can be repaired by a specific RNA type treatment. And this RNA type treatment restores the function of SMN2, SMN2 then corrects SMN1, and the patient has a longer and better life. It's not exactly a cure, but certainly it's a, a massive improvement. So that's great. And it's not just great for spinal muscular atrophy. Quite a few uh, conditions, including some uh, inherited uh, early onset blindness can probably be cured this way. And there's trials going on across the world to make this possible. There is a single problem. And that is that the cost is more than 600,000 euros or United States dollars every year per patient. And these medicines, this medicine for spinal muscular atrophy was recently the second most expensive drug on the planet. So that creates massive problems, even, even for extremely rich, rich countries like the Netherlands. And the politicians struggle with this. So that leads to a conclusion. The, problem, the problems of genetic therapy can, and actually of diagnosis I showed you earlier, can only be realized for the world if the current business model is changed and is no longer based on exclusivity and patents. It will take a bit of a miracle for that to happen, but perhaps we can be optimistic.
Because we can ask the question, do miracles actually happen? Well, quite recently, the Netherlands, for some reason, competed in the T20 World Cup cricket. And the Dutch played Sri Lanka, and there was no miracle. The Dutch were all out for 44 after 10 overs. And Sri Lanka passed that for two wickets in just seven. No miracle. And congratulations for that too. But just see, miracles do happen. Just 12 years ago, the Netherlands, in the same T20 uh, World Cup, beat England. And that was a miracle, you see. So it did happen. There was a miracle in cricket. And actually, that miracle repeated itself. Because five years later, the Netherlands again beat England in the T20 World Cup. So miracles do happen. They don't happen a lot, but I don't think we should give up hope. And we don't shouldn't give up hope for sequencing costs to come down such that we can realize the potential of that technology for medicine in the world. And um, drug prices will come down for these um, quite simple RNA therapies that are becoming available for all kinds of rare genetic diseases now. So I believe ultimately the promise of genetic therapy and diagnosis will be realized by a new business model that will not be based on exclusivity and patents. And for this to happen, we need hope. And I think hope is what we should all have looking forward. So that is what I wanted to tell you. I think genetics will be the basis for modern medicine. I think you and certainly your students will live to see this transformation. And I hope that in another 30 years or so, this will be in all your textbooks and uh, modern medicine will rely on genetics as its basis. Thank you very much. Congratulations again on your wonderful anniversary. And I wish your faculty of medicine all the best and a wonderful future. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Han, for your wonderful presentation that was lucid and uh, extremely clear for a non-genetics audience. Um, I would like to invite you, if you can, to answer some questions for us. Hello. Hello, Han. And the first question that we have been given, Han, uh, is a question by one of my colleagues in the science faculty in Colombo, and is Professor Ranil Dasnaika. And he's asking whether the same set or different exons are sequenced for different genetic diseases, including cancers, to unravel or identify genetic defects and variations behind diseases. So I think he's asking about whether you use the panel now or you still just go for whole exomes. Well, thank you for that question. I think that's a very, very good question. Um, and there, there have been different answers to that. Uh, uh, people have started using specific panel, creating panels. And the idea is that you can, you can really target your test so you can just sequence the, the, the exons that are relevant to cancer in cancer, and you will sequence the exons that are relevant to muscle disease in muscle disease patients. Um, I think what is winning in the end is the, the, the broad approach, because um, the, it's much easier to automate everything if you just put it all in, in, in a single uh, uh, enzymatic reaction kit and this is what happened what's happening and the prices of those have come down remarkably so uh, uh, i think ultimately what we're going to do is we're going to have this one single test and not just whole exome sequencing but whole genome sequencing for everything so we generate the data uh, across all the genes and then we have bioinformatics um, algorithms and programs that uh, retrieve just retrieve the information we need um, specific to the patient. I think that's where it's going. We're, we're in the middle of this process now. 
um, we never had many panels. Some of our colleagues in other universities had lots of panels. We didn't have many, but we're now transitioning away from the panels to, to whole exome and even whole genome technology. It's expensive. Uh, uh, so it's uh, so if you're in a in a tight situation money wise, you may still want to do a, a, a panel, or even use a very specific uh, cheaper technology like uh, molecular inversion probes. But if money is not the the driving concern, then I would would think that ultimately we're going to have these very very broad um, exome and genome screening panels. Thank you very much. I think Ranier probably is very happy with that question answer. Um, Han, can I also ask you a little bit about education? Because of course we are in a medical faculty. Where do you think in a very, very busy uh, undergraduate curriculum, medical genetics should be placed in this situation now in the 21st century? Uh, should we be teaching a lot more, integrating it into our clinical practice and teaching our students that? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing in Amig and yourselves? Yes, we, we have um, made an effort to, to um, give genetics a more prominent um, um, position in the curriculum, and it has worked for us. I don't think gene um, medical students necessarily need to know the, the fine detail of genetics. They don't need to actually understand genes in any great detail or these, these um, um, molecular biology procedures. But I do think it's imperative that students understand the basic fabric of genetics, you know, why it's there, the kinds of things I was explaining about rare diseases, where you, you find uh, genetic uh, um, factors, how they can be um, diagnosed and, and how you um, you do this in practice. So I think I would advocate a practical approach to genetics, not necessarily a great deal of emphasis on, on um, the ins and outs of, of the latest uh, 21st century molecular biology. Thank you very much. Um, can I just remind the audience that you should type your questions um, so that we can see them and send them across or else have to read them out to Professor Brunner? Can I also ask you about, I mean, you spoke about whole genome sequencing, and of course that is something that uh, we do not have available in Sri Lanka. So how, how would you, at the moment in your practice, how would you go from deciding who needs whole genome and who needs whole exome sequencing? Um, I would think that the, the two classes of patients that needs um, whole exome sequencing or something similar, um, uh, some, some form of gene sequencing technology. Uh, the two classes are those where um, uh, a diagnosis is important, like in, in like the examples I mentioned of, of severe disability. And the reason why it's important to know is, is for the reason I, I said, you know, it, it, these people really struggle understanding what is going on, what is what is the problem, uh, and how it came about. I think that is important, but also um, it informs reproductive decisions. If people have had a very severely handicapped child, they may wonder whether they should take the risk of having another child. And then it's really important to know whether it's a twenty-five percent recurrence risk, as it would be in recessive disease or a 1%, less than 1% recurrence risk, as it would be in a, in, in this, in a, a new mutation situation. The other, situ the other situation that I would advocate using this technology is when it influences treatment. Uh, and this could be um, in, in renal disease, you know, is this a steroid responsive type of disease or is it, um, another form of genetic disease that's not going to be steroid responsive. Um, um, cancers, you know, um, your, your surgical procedure for a breast cancer is going to be more extensive if it's BRCA1. Um, you can um, 
prevent cancers uh, if you know who, who in the family uh, is BRCA1 positive. You can prevent cancers in families where um, uh, mutations in, in, in bowel cancer genes are present. So I think whether it's treatment or preventative uh, measures, I think that's where I would uh, I would start. So inherited cancer, inherited cardiac disease, if you can um, uh, have ICDs implanted, and um, and possibly uh, diseases with with clear reproductive uh, decisions. Great. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Brunner. That was a fantastic lecture and for spending so much time and effort. And I know you've had a little few problems earlier this week, so it's, it's particularly grateful for you to make all this effort uh, and give us this fantastic lecture today. Thank you again. And I hope that uh, in the next few years post COVID, you will be able to come and watch Netherlands playing Sri Lanka um, and we'll root for each other, I suppose. Uh, and hopefully we'll get a result to our satisfaction. Thank you very much, Hans.